Today, we're going to talk about a surprising yet simpler approach to separating the stages of rockets being introduced with the SpaceX Starship. On April 20th, 2023, SpaceX launched its new Starship in a test flight. This was the first test flight integrating its super heavy booster and the Starship upper stage. As Elon Musk said, excitement is guaranteed, success is not. This was the most powerful rocket ever launched, with roughly double the thrust of the old Saturn rockets or the SLS. If everything had worked perfectly, the Starship upper stage would have separated from the Super Heavy booster, as shown in this artist's rendition. But the test didn't get that far. If it had, the goal was to put space between the booster and the upper stage before starting the upper stage engines. SpaceX came up with a new way to accomplish this, simpler than previous methods. Many people first heard about this because of this test, and that's why we're talking about it now. Some thought the tumbling Starship was attempting to use the new stage separation technique. It wasn't. That was just loss of control. To see how this would have worked, we first need to review how stage separation is normally done. In general, there is hardware to hold the stages together, and then a mechanism to separate the stages. So typically, explosive nuts or bolts are used in the clamps to hold the stages together. To release the clamps, the nuts or bolts are then exploded along seams. But SpaceX rarely uses these for several reasons. First of all, the explosive nuts or bolts can't be reused. But reusability is at the core of SpaceX design philosophy, to minimize the turnaround of time that it takes to refurbish a stage, um, as well as cost. Also, these bolts can't be tested ahead of time, because they are single-use. And there's always the risk of damaging the ship when you have things blowing up and spreading out pieces of metal. Now, in the case of the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, there are interstage clamps. But instead of being held by explosive nuts and bolts, there are piston-driven clamps pressurized by helium. Now, one place where SpaceX still uses an explosive device for the, is in the fairings. Those are the nose cone halves that must be open for release of the payload. They use a detonation cord along seams in the fairings. But anyway, just removing clamps doesn't cause the stages to separate. That takes a separate mechanism or procedure. Some Russian craft just start the upper stage engine and blast away. But SpaceX doesn't do that. For reusability, they probably wouldn't want to damage the lower stage by starting a powerful rocket engine just inches from it. Most other spacecraft separate the stages using springs, uh, mechanical pushers, or small rocket engines. Then the upper stage engines can be started. This approach requires hardware and introduces failure modes. For previous SpaceX rockets, both the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy separate the stages with a push. They use pistons pressurized by helium. For the Falcon Heavy, that includes pistons to push the outside boosters off to the side. But the new Starship approach to stage separation uses no additional hardware beyond the clamps. That fits with a general engineering principle followed at SpaceX. Eliminate anything you don't need. That's not only to reduce costs, but also to speed up design, to speed up or eliminate refurbishment of reusable vehicles, and improve reliability. The part that isn't there can't fail. And it turns out that you really don't need the complexities of hardware for stage separation beyond the clamps. The innovative new approach is really quite simple. Just before the booster engine cutoff, you start a slow rotation, end over end, or also called a pitch. You do this the normal way, by using the engines that are on gimbals to direct the thrust at an angle. This introduces angular momentum. Then you shut off the booster engines and release the interstage clamps. Physics does all the rest. The starting point is shown in this diagram, where the stages are still locked together. The spacecraft boosters are still firing, and we have just introduced rotation. Any rotation of an object in free space will be rotating around the center of mass of that object. In this case, the center of mass is indicated by the larger circle, kind of a washer there, a flattened out donut. We also show the center of mass for the individual stages with smaller circles. Now, at this point, most of the propellant in the booster is gone. That's most of the weight of the stage. So the upper stage, stage two, has five times the mass of stage one at this point. So the center of mass of the combined rocket of the two stages is on a line between the stage centers of mass. For convenience, we choose our frame of reference as the center of mass of the combined rocket. We imagine we're sitting there. That point is moving away from Earth, but from that position, there's no movement of rocket parts away from us, just rotation. The ship is rotating counterclockwise in this diagram. Because the stages are locked together, each point on the rocket is constrained to traveling in a circular path around that center of mass. 
the arrows indicate the linear velocity at a point on the rocket, indicating direction, and with the length of the arrow indicating its magnitude, or also called the speed. For a rotating object, that is, the speed and direction that a small particle would take if it were flung off, going in a straight line. For any given rate of rotation, the linear velocity is zero at the center of mass and fastest at the outside edge. That's why the arrow at the bottom of the booster is longer than the one at the top of the upper stage, because it is farther from the center of mass and hence moving faster. The velocities at the two individual stage centers of mass turns out to be important. So to highlight those, we use dashed arrows. Uh, noted in particular that the speed of the center of mass of the booster is significantly higher than that for the corresponding stage two center of mass. Uh, the arrow for the upper stage is so short that you can't really see the dash line. Now this all happens because the booster is longer than the upper stage, and the upper stage is much heavier than the lower. This diagram shows what happens next. The leftmost part of the diagram is a repeat, except that we have just shut off the booster engines now that the rotation has started. This point is where the interstage clamps are now released. Instantly, the two stages are no longer constrained in a circular motion about the combined center of gravity. Uh, you can think of this like two people being on a merry-go-round and both letting go. They'd each get flung off in different straight line directions rather than being constrained to a circular path. So, what happens? Looking at the booster, it's obvious that every part of it starts off with velocity pointing down and to the right in this diagram. For the upper stage, almost all of that is moving upwards and to the left. It tells you which directions the stages are now going to go. That alone gives you the broad picture that the stages separate, but we will need to get into more detail on just how small the disruption is to the upper stage flight path. And we can still do that without showing any math. Uh, a side note here, the booster engines must be turned off for the stages to separate cleanly and avoid any damage from simultaneous sliding and rotating and pushing or bumping. If the booster engines are still firing, they would push the booster up against the upper stage and cause some damage. It's a convenient feature of mechanics that we can think separately about motion of any part of the rocket as determined by the straight line motion through the center of the mass and that combined with the rotational motion around that center of mass. That straight line motion is also called translation. So the straight line motion of the objects in space can always be analyzed by thinking about all the mass and velocity as concentrated at the center of mass. As a result, the booster is flung off in a straight line at the velocity, meaning both speed and direction, of the center of mass of the booster. All the other velocities now represent rotation around the center of mass of the booster. And similarly for the upper stage, the upper stage is flung off upwards and to the left. Both stages do retain their counterclockwise rotation. There's a conservation of angular momentum. The middle part of the diagram shows the stages a short time later, and the right part of the diagram shows it later than that. The linear motion of the overall booster is at the speed and direction of its center of mass that was established at the moment the clamps released. Since it now has linear motion, we highlighted that by changing the dashed arrow to red. Note that its magnitude and direction don't change in the three parts of the diagram, despite the rotation. That same is true, is, same is true for the upper stage as well. Now, to keep the diagram uncluttered, the center of mass of the two stages is not shown in the middle part of the diagram. But note, the center of the mass of the two stages, whether locked or separated, doesn't change. That's because no external forces were applied here. Linear momentum is conserved. The momentum right and downward of the a uh, lighter lower stage exactly balances the momentum of the heavier upper stage. There's a similar story for the angular momentum, which is also conserved. The upper stage rotates more slowly because it is both heavier than a lower stage and shorter. So, the net result is that the path of the upper stage doesn't change much compared to the lower stage, and it rotates less as well. That's why this approach is fairly painless. In simulations, from the point of view of the upper stage, it looks like the upper stage just kind of flicks away at the lower stage. Furthermore, the booster rotation is actually beneficial. It needed to start rotating anyway to start the belly flop maneuver. There's a maneuver to descend on its side, presenting the maximum area for air friction and dissipating the associated heat. As we mentioned earlier, there was confusion during the test because Starship was tumbling. Some people, including the SpaceX announcers, at first thought this was the start of the rotation prior to stage separation, but it wasn't. That tumbling was due to loss of control. 
In these pictures from the launch video, you can see the rotation in 90 degree steps. When the separation didn't happen, then people thought there must be a problem with the interstage clamps releasing. But no command was actually issued to release the clamps. The booster never shut down, so the separation technique wouldn't have worked. So, I hope this explanation was helpful. We're looking forward to the next test, and we want to finally see this new stage separation approach. It should look like the right-hand picture, not the deliberate termination explosion that happened during the test shown on the left. Other space-related videos or slide presentations by me are available at the link shown here. That includes a web page and also a list of videos at my YouTube channel, so you can view them or subscribe for notifications about future videos. These presentations are mostly made as part of the meetings of National Space Society's North Houston chapter, and the link to that is shown. Topics like these are presented as part of a monthly news segment, and there are also lots of other interesting speakers and open discussions. You can attend in person or online via Zoom. Come join us.